Hey Dreamers, I hope everyone had a great week with an even better weekend ahead. So July is now over and we are getting closer to the end of the summer, which is really sad because I really enjoy this summer. A couple quick things I want to share. The financial report for July will be available in about a week or so. You can check those out as well as the current download stats for the show at howtodream.co slash income. Tomorrow, Saturday, August 2nd at 7 p.m., I will be live streaming video from Adventuratorium Live. I invite you all to check out Adventuratorium.com, download for free or stream for free, as well as donate to Give Kids the World and even buy t-shirts and buy a limited edition dual CD set of Adventuratorium. I will be performing a live version of my DJ mix inspired by Pixar's Up with Disney music mashups done live on two turntables. Again, tomorrow night, August 2nd, 7 p.m., there will be a live video feed of me performing Adventuratorium. You can check it out at Adventuratorium.com. Check the show notes for a link. I hope everyone has a magical weekend. Take care. And of course, I'm I'm here with Joe on his show, and thank you for inviting me. This was really nice of you to let me talk for way too long. You are going to edit this, right? Like with a hacksaw and a chisel, and get it down to three or four hours. Is that the plan now? Oh, I I apologize to all you people. Okay, you know, just you got things to do, right? Laundry, cooking, you know, just make the bed. I owe you all an hour and a half of your lives. I'm really sorry. This is the Dreamers Podcast, where dreamers share their stories to inspire you. Now, join host Joe Pardo as he interviews a dreamer who's living their dreams. Welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pardo, and today I am interviewing Jim Hill, who is living his dream through writing about theme parks and animation. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hey, Joe. How are you doing? Doing wonderful. How about yourself? Um, well, I, you know, just provided the house isn't struck by lightning and I don't die in a horrible flood, I'm good! You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> As Joe and I are recording this, there is this giant storm covering the eastern seaboard. In fact, if we're lucky, we'll hear thunder in the background with you, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm at least on higher ground. So I'm going to just, you know, and you, you're in the basement. You could be the first to go, Joe. You I, know? I could be. <laughs> okay. Jersey so. is supposed to fall off into the water at some point, isn't it? <laughs> oh, be nice to Jersey. I'm, I'm, Nancy has family down there and. You know, whenever we go back and forth to Florida, we're always driving through through Jersey. And I love the names there, Hoboken, Secaucus, you know, Weehawken. And just, you know, when you live up where I live, where everything's a borough, you know, it's a Boxborough, Northborough, Southborough, Middleborough. It's like, you guys couldn't come up with any names? You know, we look in Jersey and it's just like, ah, oh, Secaucus. I mean, there's a name. So... You know, it's funny you say that. I actually live in a Clarksboro next to a Paulsboro, next to a Swedesboro, <laughs> next to a Gibbsboro. You got to wonder, did they get like a break? You know, just sort of like, you know, we're, we've got these five letters left over. All I got to do is put something in front of it, you know. So. <laughs> well, well, let's get started by giving some background about yourself. Uh, oof, well, this is going to be boring. Um, I, I, again, I'm, I'm a guy, fat guy lives in New Hampshire, uh, kind of backed into writing about Disney. Basically I was in the military. I was a Disney dweeb from way back. I mean, again, again, not to date myself, but as a 55 year old, I remember when there were only three channels and one of them was NBC and, on Sunday night, that was when you sat down at 7.30 or thereabouts and watched kindly old Uncle Walt, uh, who introduced the wonderful world of color. And every so often, he'd do a show about the theme parks or Imagineering or animation. You know, more often than not, it was a big dog that was lost in the forest and somehow made its way home. But every so often, there'd be these great Imagineering-based shows or great animation shows. And that just fascinated me. So I began chasing Disney information about the Disney company at an early, early age. Uh, in fact, I remember it must have been 71, 72. The very first Disney history books 
uh, were Richard Schickel's The Disney Version, which is really kind of a nasty book. It was clear, even as a 10, 11, 12 year old reading the thing, Richard didn't really like the Walt Disney Company and you know, just wrote in the most negative possible terms. Where the other book was, was actually the Disney films. It was Leonard Bolton. God, I remember it was about 10 or 15 years ago. Leonard was hosting a talk at the Philadelphia Film Festival. He was actually interviewing Roy Disney at the, you know, Roy E. Disney talking about his career. And at the end of the presentation, you know, so, you know, the entire Disneyana community lines up to get autographs with Roy or get their picture taken and that sort of thing. And I'm the one slob going over to Leonard, you know, sitting there by the piano alone. I bring out this, my moth-eared, beaten up, and it's like, I have the first edition of this book. I, I read this. And it's like, she's, she's like, I, this is cool. You know, just everybody else has the paperbacks. And I had the hardback from way, way back. But again, that's what you had to do back then. In this pre-internet phase, these things called books and magazines and newspapers that you actually had to read and chase down the info. And then from there, I you know, jump ahead to the early 80s. I end up in the military. I'm a journalist because... The nice thing about journalists is they don't send you places where things blow up. You know, you, you, you I mean, you go there after they've blown up and, oh, my God, it blew up. You know, but you're, you're, if you're lucky, you're not there when they're actually shooting at you. So spent four years in the Army. And while I was there, a friend I'd gone to the Defense Information College with uh, ended up on the West Coast at, I want to say, 29 Palms, which is a military base on the West Coast. And this is, this is 83, and Donald Duck had just turned 50. And the commander of 29 Palms was this complete publicity hog. He, he loved seeing his face in the paper. He loved, you know, just he wanted pictures. He wanted stories about himself. And he shows up one day at the PR office and is like, Donald Duck is 50 years old. And everyone kind of blinks at him and goes, okay. And didn't he make cartoons during World War II? And my friend Marjorie Ebert, who worked at the office, said, well, I don't know that for sure, but I know this idiot in Massachusetts I could call who maybe would have information about this. Hang on. So she gets on the phone. She calls me and says, yes, Donald Duck did several cartoons during World War II, you know, Sergeant Duck and blah, 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 you know, various different names. And so she goes back to her commander and says, yes. Then he goes, did he ever retire from the military? And called me back and said, no, I don't think so, but hang on. I know Dave Smith, so I called the Disney Archive, and Dave goes through all of his papers, and nope, never retired. And so this, this base commander, seriously, it, this is his big idea. He is going to hold a retirement ceremony for Donald Duck. All right? And again, just keep in mind, folks, this is your tax dollar at work. All right? He sets up, he calls the Disney company. They love this idea. They go down to the closet and they pull out every duck costume that's ever existed in the history of man. So Huey, Dewey, Louie, Daisy, Ludwig von Drake, Uncle Scrooge, they're all coming. All right. And they're coming to 29 Palms. And get in, not only that, but in vintage 1940s cars. And, you know, the Disney creates this, this uniform for Donald. Uh, I guess he's still a private at this point. And the base, on the other hand, assembles a pageant. Okay, we're talking about 1,500 soldiers pass in review. We're talking a full military band, you know, color guard. The works, all right? And again, and you paid for this, all right? And it all came down to this picture that wound up in the paper of the general smiling into the camera as he hands Donald in his World War II uniform his retirement certificate. And it says... Buck Sergeant Duck, because, of course, they promoted him before they let him out of the service. My friend writes a story to go with the photograph, and it gets great play on the West Coast. And she sends me a copy of the article, and she sends me an 8 by 10 of the photo. And I read her article, and it's great. It's fun, and the fo but the photo's killer. And I call Marjorie back and go say, look, if I ask nice, can I, you know, I'll use your photo, I'll credit your name to it, but can I write a version of this article because I'd love to do this for my base newspaper because I think it's funny as hell. And she says, no, absolutely. You helped, you know, with the research and do what you want. But the what difference was my version got picked up by the AP wire service and went worldwide. 
hers did well on the West Coast, but suddenly I'm in Britain, I'm in Germany, I'm everywhere, and I get this call from Disney, and they said, God, we loved your article. It was really funny and very interesting and well-researched, and by the way, we're holding the 30th anniversary of Disneyland, and we were wondering if you'd like to come out and cover that. And it's like, oh, sure, you know, and that's kind of how it started. That was a bizarre event. I mean, it was, they had a 30 hour long party. So the park was open from like six o'clock at night till a day or so later, six o'clock in the morning. I remember distinctly, they really let us do things we should not have been allowed to do. I actually stood on the roofs of Main Street USA and looked down at all of the people running back and forth and there was a lot of really rotten plywood up there. I, I, I could have wound up in the Emporium real easy. Also, they let us climb all over the, the Main Street electrical parades. They were parked backstage between Main Street and Tomorrowland. And I, this was about the same time that Return to Oz, the movie, had come out. And I was one of the only people on the planet who really liked Return to Oz. So they had TikTok, the, the army, the Royal Army of Oz, the little brass guy there. And, you know, oh, my God, it must be the one from the film. And I lean down and I look and it's like, it's got the plaques. It's like you turn this one for the brain and you turn this one for his action. And, you know, so I had to I had to try. I turned the key and it came off in my hand. And about this moment that Disney security came around the corner and I jumped off the float and ran into the press tent. So somewhere down in the basement, I still have to TikTok's key and. It's one of my nightmares that some night TikTok is eventually going to find me. It's like, where's my key? But no, that, that's the thing. That was the event where I got to meet a lot of the Disney legends who had come out, who had worked in the park, and I got to interview them. And they liked that I actually knew who they were and what they'd done. And they would say, the next time in California, you want to come to the house, you know, do things like I got to go to Mark and Alice Davis's house. In fact, that was with my ex, Michelle. Mark was kind of a prankster. You'd go into his studio and go to sit down in a chair and, you know, he'd be, oh, by the way, that's Walt's chair. And, you know, everybody, for some reason, would just jump out of the chair because that, you know, oh, my God, they, you know, it's just like this has Walt's aspirin in it. But, yeah, he shared great stories about attractions that he worked on. And year after year after year, you know, of talking with people and interviewing people and them introducing me to other folks, it just – it's kind of mushroomed and blossomed since then. And and now, these days, I have my own website, Jim Hill Media. I also write for the Huffington Post. And so it that's where it really got strange when I started working for HuffPo, because suddenly I went from somebody who worked basically in the Disney blogosphere and people liked what I did to suddenly it was like, oh, could you talk about our movie? <laughs> you know, and it's just this whole notion of, because, again, I get to, to talk to the, the huge Huffington Post audience as opposed to the small Disney blogosphere audience. And so the joke I make is I get a much nicer class of people saying no now, you know, just this whole notion of. But at the same time, you, you get the help. I mean, uh, just right now, for example, Glenn Keane has left the Walt Disney Company and is doing. You might have actually seen this prop up online that his private passion project that he's done for uh, Google Plus Duet. This is the, the thing that's actually, you're going to be able to, it's sort of design animation. That's the first piece of classically drawn, hand-drawn animation that's being done for a handheld device. You know, it, it's, it's a very different concept of movie making. I mean, the notion is if you hold it directly in front of you, you have this amazing piece of animation. But if you move it to either side, there's actually pieces of animation that key off of that. I mean, the whole notion of you're surrounded by animation. And at the same time, they're telling this wonderful story. And, and this is actually a passion project for, for Glenn. Glenn's actually working with his son, Max, who, you know, for those of you who, who love Tarzan and Tarzan sort of skateboarding his way through the trees, that's Max. That's Glenn got that idea by watching his son skateboard in the driveway. And wouldn't it be cool if Tarzan did that? Um, meanwhile, if you saw Tangled, and love the, you know, for example, the little baby girl version of Rapunzel. That's his granddaughter. You know, that that's, you know, they modeled baby Rapunzel after the granddaughter. In fact, uh, Glenn's daughter, Claire, was one of the art directors in Tangled. So they're all three of them working on this amazing piece of animation. And, and where I come in is I'm the one who gets to write the article. 
that helps to sort of raise the awareness of it. And what's really cool is this this wonderful opportunity coming up in a week or so where Disney's finally putting Tarzan out on Blu-ray. And I reached out to Glenn and said, hey, we've got that great story about, you know, you watching your son skateboard. And why don't we tell that story as a way to say, hey, and now you and your son are working together on this film. I think, honestly, that's kind of what I'm doing now. I used to do a lot of Disney history. I used to do a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And now I just feel like I've kind of mutated into this position of like, well, how can I help? For example, I was just contacted by a gentleman who's writing a book about the Disney online fan community. And it was just one of these things where he was interviewing me to get some stories and at the same time thought, well, you know, you should probably be reaching out to the theme park press people. They do a lot of Disney titles these days, and I'm sure that they would help, you know, or this sounds like a book they'd be interested in and contact them, tell them I told you, you know, that told them to reach out. And if there's anything else I can do to help to open the doors again, I wouldn't have gotten where I am today. wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now. If a lot of people, whether they're Disney legends or people who are working on animated films or, or that sort of thing, hadn't been nice enough to go, okay, fine. You know, I'll listen to the fat man's questions. And they liked the articles that I wrote and they in turn introduced me to their friends or opened, held open doors for me. So I, I feel it's really part of my job to pay it back. You know, the whole notion of if somebody comes and asks me for information, I share. If somebody, you know, needs help, an introduction or a door held open, I feel that's part of my gig as well. What's really kind of fun is my own daughter, Alice, has started doing uh, what I do now. In fact, she, we, we were just talking about this off mic that she went and covered the Muppets Most Wanted premiere for JHM and did a great job. And she's actually headed to Comic Con next week and going to be covering that for the site while dad stays home and writes. I, I guess she also has the gift for asking questions that people like and they open up and tell great stories. Boy, that's a really long winded answer. We still have time to record at this point or oh no, I'm sorry, Jim, we're done. That one question ended the show. So, <laughs> good night, everybody. So so No, I, hopefully you didn't answer too many of my future questions. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, back up the truck. So 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 what does writing mean to you? I, I don't know. All of all of my heroes are writers. John Steinbeck, Neil Simon, Gene Shepard, um, you know, Larry Gelbart, you know, people who can not only inform, but entertain, can make you laugh. The one thing that stands out differently from the stuff I do than a lot of people do online about Disney or theme parks or animation is I'm always in it for the stories. I'm always in it for if I can make you laugh and I can make you think. For example, I just I, I just interviewed the guys who were doing Planes, Fire and Rescue. And there was this wonderful moment out of the interview where they were talking about, you know, you ever watch when a plane is dropping chemicals in a fire, you know, that, that weird sort of red crap that comes out the back. It has a, a technical name, but for the people, the aerial firefighters, the way they refer to it, it's either mud or slurry. And what it is, is, you know, it, you deliberately drop it in front of the fire and it sort of, it's kind of this salt based stuff that, that stops the fire from spreading. It, it creates this artificial chemical barrier. And I'm talking with Paul Girard, who is the creative director for Disney Toon Studios. And he says, so I'm at the Hemet Ryan Air Attack Base in California, which is actually located Riverside, California, literally just down the road, basically from, from Glendale, where the Disney Media Campus is. He says, you know, so I couldn't help myself. So I, you know, I reached out and I touched this stuff. And it feels like snot. All right. And it's like one of these things. And I know snot because I have an eight year old son. All right. And so you know, he said, I made the mistake of mentioning it to the other animators and artists who had come along on this field trip that they actually went to the base so they could design the, you know, the characters and based on the actual vehicles and also, you know, sort of the look of the base. He says, ooh, this stuff feels like snot. And so the animators to a man went, really? Can I touch it? And it was just this whole notion of that animators in their heart of hearts are really just big kids. You know, I mean, that's one of the reasons that you get that sense of fun and joy that comes through really good animation because they've kept a the kid alive in them. And, and just the whole notion of here's this, this group of supposed grownups where somebody says, hey, this feels like snot. It's like, oh, I got to touch that. I just I, I love stories like that. I love stuff that humanizes people, that makes 
the person who makes the animated film or, or, or makes your favorite movie or makes your favorite attraction relatable. I mean, it makes them sound like a person, not a press release. But yeah, I mean, that's what I, I, I love about writing. If you can do that, if you can bring people sort of behind the curtain and talk about their favorite movie in a way that surprises them. You know, for example, Frozen, you know, that the whole notion of two years before that movie hit theaters, they didn't know Anna and Elsa were sisters. I mean, think about that. They had labored for years where the Ice Queen was this kind of comic villain. In fact, relatively recent version of this where it, the idea was that Elsa or the Ice Queen was either going to be voiced by Megan Mullally, who you, you may know from Will and Grace, played the Karen character who was really obnoxious, or Bette Midler, you know, the whole note of this big, brassy showgirl. And, you know, an entirely different, you know, think about what an entirely different movie that would have been. That kind, nice, sweet Anna dealing with Bette Midler. And it was somebody just at Disney drew this drawing of the two of them standing back to back and sort of looking sisterly. And somebody's like, oh, my God, they're sisters. Wouldn't that be bizarre? And this whole movie grows out of one drawing. And, and even then, you know, just two years out. It's like, that's good. That's great. Okay, that's in theaters November 2013. And, and everybody hard charges at it. Just the notion of they did it. They actually pulled it off on that impossible schedule, that effects heavy movie. They were smart enough to bring Kirsten and Bobby Lopez in to do the music. And it all became this huge phenomena that I will tell you flat out, they didn't know what they had. August of last year, uh, Nancy and I were invited down to a screening in New York. We were the first civilians to get to see Frozen, you know, and we're in the world's tiniest screening room. I swear there's like 15, 16 seats. It's, it's on Fifth Avenue in New York. And 51st and 5th, I think. And we're sitting in an audience full of people with suits and ties and looking very severe. And they start the movie. Nobody laughs. Nobody applauds. Nobody says anything. The movie ends and Nancy's are like, wow, we kind of enjoy that. Why is everyone so quiet? And it turns out we're in a room full of agents and they're watching the movie. All they care about is how their client came across. In fact, I remember as I was leaving, the woman standing by the door who ran the press event. And what did you think? And this woman who represented both Adina Mazel and Kristen Bell. Is, well, I think it serviced my clients very well. It's like, did you like the movie? I think it serviced my clients very well. Two or three days later, I'm in L.A. and they're doing the long lead media event. So finally, I end up, you know, they, everybody gets a chance to talk to everybody. So I finally end up sitting down with Chris Buck and Jennifer Lee, the two co-directors of this. And they actually, they lean in close because I'm the only one of the, all, all the other members of the press have only seen 20 minutes of this movie. They've only seen, and they only showed us action scenes. I mean, the, the snow guy chasing after Anna and Kristoff. And I think you, the one song they showed us was Let It Go. But everything else is action, you know, and comedy and, you know, they, musical. What, what musical? You are out of your mind. This isn't a musical. But they lean in close because I'm the only one who's seen it. It's like, did it work? Is it okay? Is it good? And they didn't know. I mean, they're literally, you know, they're six away, weeks away from, at this point, it being released at theaters. And they didn't know what they had. You know, so they were just, please tell us it's good. And so, oh, my God, is it good? And so, oh, good. Oh, wow. Okay. We were, we were worried because, you know, you, you work on something like that for so long and you're so close to it. You don't know how people are going to respond, which I guess we could discuss Muppet was wanted at this point, Joe, or you could move to another topic. Hey, what's the next question? So. <laughs> well, well, what would you say inspires you? What inspires me is getting information out when somebody hands me a good story or I'm able to connect dots. I mean, for example, there was, there was a story I wrote once called Disney's Long, Long Road to Oz. And it was one of the more popular things I ever wrote for the web, but it was one of these things where people can be like, wow, that's a great story. It's like, well, good. I'm glad you liked it. It took 15 years. I mean, it took a long time to pull all of those stories together and the little bits and pieces that people had told me over time and just sort of to string them all together and, and come up to, with a cohesive whole that, that told you about 
how Walt back in the 1930s, you know, did actually pursue the rights to the Wizard of Oz and only to find out that Samuel Goldwyn had them. And then when they became available, MGM snatched them. But the reason MGM snatched them is because Snow White had just come out. It was making more money than God. And it's like suddenly MGM's like, well, I want one of those. And so it's like, all right, so we could turn you know, the Wizard of Oz into a musical. The return to Oz and the, the thing that Disney was going to do there. And that was actually produced by Gary Kurtz, but it was directed by Walter Murch, who was the gentleman who did all of the sound editing, I want to say, or the editing editing for Star Wars. And Disney just wanted somebody associated with Star Wars to be in charge of that movie. And he did a great job, but it was a dark, weird movie that... It took a couple of decades for people to find it and like it. But yeah, I mean, to get back to it, that sort of stuff excites me. That to get a story out there or to step into a situation where people think is one thing and is really another. And you have to sort of apply the lessons of history and go, you know, I mean, for example, everyone's right now kind of fretting about the subs for Disneyland. And they're coming back for the 60th anniversary, but you now are they going to stay after that. And and the hard reality is that the subs since they opened in 59 have been an operational nightmare. I mean, they back then they were powered by diesel and, you know, they always gave off these horrible fumes. And in order to make the water clear enough for people to look out through the portholes and actually see the show scenes, that's things chlorinated up the yin yang. And so that means your beautifully colored coral after six to eight months fades away. And Likewise, the strings that held the fish into place corrode and snap and the fish float away. So it was one of these things where every year they had to shut it down for a prolonged rehab and repaint. And so when it closed in the late 90s, there were a lot of people in Disney like, oh, God, thank God that ride has gone away. But it turns out that John Lasseter, who'd worked at the park in the 60s, loved it. And there was this thing called Finding Nemo that they wanted to put in the parks and you know, so they brought it back and I want to say 2007, but it still has a lot of the problems that it had back in 59. It's got low capacity, it's a maintenance nightmare. And so I, if you're a subs fan, I would suggest seeing them next year during Disneyland 60th, because I'm not entirely convinced what was everything that's planned for Tomorrowland, what would be Star Warsization of that side of the park, that the subs are going to survive that. They need a lot of room for what they're planning to do for Star Wars in the parks. And it's entirely possible the, the subs will fall victim to a higher capacity attraction that celebrates Star Wars. So if you want to find Nemo, you better look for him soon. That's what I'm saying. So. You are talking about 20 Leagues Under the Sea, right? No, no, no. This is the the Disneyland version of uh, the, the subs out there, the, the ones... For Florida, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, of course, that, <laughs> again, same thing. They, they shut that down, and I want to say 94 for a quote-unquote temporary rehab. And then two years later, basically admitted, nah, we're closed. And that, of course, eventually became New Fantasyland, though there was this wonderful little moment where for a time there it was going to be where New Fantasyland is now, the whole aerials you know, the Bell's Village, uh, the Be Our Guest restaurant, that was going to be Disney's villain village. There was this great idea that basically there'd be this sort of weird, scary gate and every morning it would open and the villains could come out of where Disney kept them locked up at night because, you know, again, you want to keep an eye on these guys. And so if you went down into the village, there would be, it wasn't Gaston's Tavern, but it was, I'm forgetting the villain they had it built around, but there was an Ursula spinner. There was, oh, no, 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 it was the puppeteer Stromboli. Stromboli's sort of restaurant tavern, kind of a dark, scary place where you could go to eat and where the villains would hang out. In fact, there was this great idea that they actually tried to revive with Gaston's. Turns out they didn't accommodate space for this. There was supposed to be this great show that would happen every day at 5 o'clock if you were down by Stromboli's. And eventually, again, they wanted to sort of revive this idea for Gaston's. And you'd start to notice that from different sides of the park, here comes Captain Hook, and here comes Maleficent, and here comes the old hag from, you know, Snow White. And they'd all meet up at the bar, and they'd kind of crestfallen, and they'd order a drink, and they would proceed. To, I almost had her. I 
I swear to God, I had her. You know, I gave her the apple and those stupid dwarves. And just the notion of these that evidently was supposed to build into this great musical number about how the villains almost succeeded, but they're going to buck their spirits up. And tomorrow they're going to go out again and try to defeat these stupid princesses and that kid in the green thing that flew. And, you know, and it was this great idea. And I just I keep hoping that that bubbles up again. And in fact, that's the other thing of I think that's important about my job is that I'll hear about this stuff. I'll hear about people, you know, various ideas. And the, kind of the problem with Imagineering right now is it's it's not got a lot of institutional memory. It's a lot of newer people or younger people who have risen up from, through the ranks, but they don't know. You know, they, they don't know they're in history. And it's just one of those things where it's like, why don't you guys revisit that villain idea? It's like, what villain idea? Go to the files. Go pull the files. And sure enough, they'll pull the files. And there's things like the Villain Mountain theme park attraction. Uh, that was actually supposed to be built. This kind of keyed off of the fact that Splash Mountain had huge lines. And so the belief within Disney is like, wow, we need another film ride. And meanwhile, we have 20,000 Leagues of Loon just sitting empty. And wouldn't it be cool if, you know, uh, maybe we could do a flume ride into that and then somebody was saying, well, we're doing the Villain Village. And it's like, what if we did a ride that that had all of these the villains in it? And again, I just I got lucky. One of my friends who worked for the company for a number of years liked this idea so much that when he was leaving Disney, he spent his last afternoon at, at Imagineering color Xeroxing all of the concept art. So I've seen it. I've seen the art for the, the Villain Mountain. And it it had a really killer gimmick. The whole notion is it's a standard flume ride. In fact, you do that classic scene that you do in every flume ride when they have to get you up to the top of, you know, so you chunk, 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 chunk up the show scene where you start to begin your descent down the mountain. And in this room, you're in with Maleficent. And so she turns and sees you. And you can actually see where your boat is supposed to go in the next room. And even in enough Disney theme park rides, saying, okay, so I'm in a trough. I'm at the top. That's the next room we're going to go in. That's where I drop out of it. It's like... So, okay, I'm comfortable. It's like, no. What happens is Maleficent waves her staff, a hole blows in the wall next to you, and your your flume vehicle now sort of heels over in this direction and falls through this hole in the wall. And, you know, you, you dive down straight down to the bottom of the building out of this show scene. As you're diving, you're going in between Ursula's tentacles because she's trying to grab you and stop you. And you end up at the bottom and you're surrounded by flames and suddenly you hear the sound of a fire extinguisher and the flames start to go out. And as the clouds clear, it's Hades from Hercules with a fire extinguisher. It's like, hi, I'm Hades, Lord of the Dead. How are you doing? And that's the sort of ride it was going to be. It was this really funny ride that played with your knowledge of the villains and also played with your knowledge of how theme park attractions work. I mean, the whole notion of, wait a minute, that's where I'm supposed to be going. Well, you ain't going there. And again, the finale of the ride, I don't know how they would have pulled it off, but you finally, you get to the very top of the mountain for the big splashdown. And it's only as you enter the room, you realize that you're basically in between Chernabog's hands and he wakes up as you are there, you know, in the room, in his presence, and his hands start to reach toward you to grab the boat. And it's just at that precise second when he's going to get you that you go fall down the outside thing. But again, killer attraction, the art's there. They could turn key on this thing tomorrow. It's designed, it's planned, but nobody remembers it except me because I got to see the art in Justin Jorgensen's living room. So go figure. <laughs> Not to name any names or anything. Not to name any names. But if you're looking for where the art is, go to Justin's house. <laughs> well, originally, how was your dream of writing received by your family members? I come from a family of teachers, so there was a lot of pressure to become a teacher because the whole notion was like, look, if you want to seriously write, you could be an English teacher and you'd have your summers off and you could write then and... I almost, almost, almost went that route until I graduated high school. I was starting to go to college in Birmingham State in Massachusetts when, <sighs> this is a hard story to tell, but basically my favorite English teacher on the planet, an amazing guy, you know, introduced me to people like Robert Benchley and Dorothy Parker. I mean, writers I love to this day. 
And, you know, I, I enjoyed this guy so much during high school. I must have taken three and four different classes with him. Amazing guy. And in fact, I so enjoyed working with him. I became the co-editor of the, the yearbook because he was the guy who was in charge of the yearbook. And, and a girl who lived on my street was the other co-editor of the yearbook. Really funny, very talented young lady. And, and I just figured this is the sort of English teacher I want to be. I mean, this is the guy who gets people excited about uh, writers and, you know, and is really in touch with the students. And, you know, this, this is who I want to emulate. And so September, October, November of that year, I get a call from, again, my co-editor of the yearbook who kind of pulls me aside and says, I want you to be the first to know, but I'm pregnant. It's like, oh, oh, that's kind of a surprise. And who's the father? And it's the English teacher. And it was one of these things where it's like, you know, and this was the guy who I was modeling my path after. All right. It's like, that's, that's the sort of teacher I want to be. And he gets my best friend from high school pregnant. And it, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. In fact, I've met him since he's still a wonderful person and I'm still friendly with the young lady. In fact, the daughter is, she's such a great kid, such a great, and you know, well, great adult now. But it was one of these wake up moments where it's like, if I follow that path, you know, in 20 years, I'm going to be making the same exact mistakes. I'm going to end up being that same English teacher who gets bored or takes a stupid risk. And, and this was actually, again, this is 77, where you were allowed to resign. You didn't end up on Fox News. All right. You know, and uh, that's what kind of spurred me to maybe I shouldn't teach. You know, the interesting thing is having, again, a family of teachers now, all I hear my brothers and sister talking about is how tough it is to teach now, where you have things like No Child Left Behind, where you're suddenly in this situation where you aren't really teaching kids to teach. You're teaching kids how to take a test so they can then prove that they've been taught. And it's just teaching has become something different over the last couple of decades. So in a, a weird sort of way, I'm glad I went in this direction. It was a tougher path. I mean, the thing of writing is that particularly when I was coming up, you chase a good steady gig like working for a newspaper because that was, you know, a steady paycheck. But on the other hand, there was good money to be made in magazines, but you had to send something off and hope and pray it was what they were looking for or that the editor liked you and then wait for the check to come back. So it was tough. At the same time, tried different types of writing. For a couple of years there, I tried my hand at screenwriting. And that I came scarily close to actually making that work. I actually got a script optioned for a Haunted Mansion movie that Disney was going to try to make with the folks at Keystone, which are the people who make all of the Air Bud movies for Disney. And, you know, they optioned the script. I got a very nice check. And, but again, it was kind of conditional on, and as soon as we see how well Hocus Pocus does at the box office, we're going to make a decision about Haunted Mansion. And I know everybody loves Hocus Pocus now, but when it came out in 94, 93, did not make a whole lot of money. You know, the Haunted Mansion just stopped there, but. Uh, I also wrote a sample script for a version of The Adventurers Club as a, a sitcom that was going to be shot in Orlando. And the Disney Channel, I mean, that made that very high up. It was very strange because they were excited about the idea of being able to use, say, Epcot as sort of a setting that they could send the adventurers off and they could go to China or Africa or that sort of thing. And I wrote a sample script and a treatment for like six or seven episodes after that. It was kind of interesting that this was the Disney Channel trying to decide what it wanted to be when it grew up. And they, you know, it's like, look, we have this Adventures Club thing from Jim Hill. And we have this script called Lizzie McGuire. Hmm, what should we do? Um, and, you know, I, I think we all know the end of that story. You know, Lizzie McGuire, Big Ed, Miley Cyrus, the oh, Hannah Montana you know, and, and now we're in, you know, places like Mighty Med or Dog with a Blog. You know, that's they were just discovering that they wanted to do sitcoms for kids. And that's where they are now. So, I mean, it's interesting to wonder what would have happened if I'd gone that route. But I honestly, I always feel bad for people who spend entirely too much time staring in the rearview mirror. Yeah, it was an opportunity. It would have been cool if that had happened. But because it didn't happen, other equally fun opportunities came along. And, 
right now, as I was mentioning earlier, it just, you know, you never know what the day is going to bring. I mean, just this morning, up getting coffee, and here comes the FedEx truck rundling up the driveway, and they drop off a box full of Big Hero 6 stuff. And I'm just now talking with the folks at Walt Disney Studios about what are the story opportunities here? You know, who who can I talk to? And and it's interesting because I've, I've actually interviewed a bunch of these guys before. I mean, Roy Connolly, the producer of this, is the producer of Winnie the Pooh. Likewise, Don Hall is one of the directors on that. And I've talked with all of them before. The nice thing is when you're interviewing somebody you've inter- interviewed previously, and if it's gone well, you know, you, you can get through that five minutes of, well, how's your kids? Very quickly and, and just get to the actual meat of the conversation and, and hopefully get some cool stories. But, but that's, again, that's what I'm doing now. So how was all this Disney fame received by your friend who wrote the original article that you got her permission to use to write your article to become Mr. Jim Hill? Honestly, the <laughs> became you know, Mr. Jim Hill. That took 30 years. And to be honest, Marjorie went on to have a great career in really for real writing. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, she, she wrote the magazines, newspapers. She's very happy with her life now. Um, and, but it, at the same time, you know, I never planned on writing for the web. I mean, I, I was a magazine newspaper guy and I got a call in, I want to say 98 from my ex-wife, Michelle, and she was working with Al Lutz on the precursor of Mouse Planet, the website called the Disneyland Information Guide. And they had just decided that they wanted to start doing publishing stories on a a regular basis. They didn't know if they would do, you know, two or three a week or five a week or what what they were going to do. But Michelle thought, you know, well, Jim writes and he knows a lot about Disney. Let me call him. She was like, look, can you do just one story? We just need one. And as it turns out, Kim Masters' book about Michael Eisner had just come out. The title of that book, (laughs) it had a great subtitle. It was The Rise of Michael Eisner and the Fall of Everybody Else. And I'd read it and thought, okay, this is fun. And I just threw together a quick review of it. And that got published. I have to admit, that was my first taste of the immediacy of the web. I mean, I handed it off and I'm a guy who, all right, so you write something for a newspaper and it has to go through an editor and there's... 24 hours before it comes into print, or God help you if you're writing for a magazine where it can be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days before you see it. And the web thing was handed it off to L, Al, and an hour later, it's up on the web. And it's like, wow, that's cool. And it was that first little taste of heroin, ooh, you know, and then from there, you know, just like, ooh, I, I, that was fun. I want to do that again. And that's where I am now. I mean, it just, it's kind of fun. For example, right now, as we're recording this, I stopped working on an article I'm doing about planes, fire, and rescue. I've got a piece that as soon as we wrap up here, I go over, put it up on HuffPo, and that's bizarre. I mean, HuffPo is this big worldwide organization, you know, just, you know, new media. And for the longest time, I just treated it like, you know, magazine or newspaper. It's like, okay, I'm working for the big boys, so... You know, I'd contact my editor and say, hey, I got an idea for a story and I'm doing an interview next week. And would you like to do this? Sure. And so say 90 days, three months after I started, eventually my editor said, you know, Jim, you understand about the whole blog idea, right? You know, you got the job. (laughs) I mean, you don't have to actually ask my permission to write about something. We we trust you. We like you. You know, we, we, we wouldn't have reached out if we didn't like what you do. But even then, there was still this sort of weird period where you'd submit it. And there'd be, sometimes it'd be an hour, sometimes it would be six hours before things would be posted on on HuffPost's entertainment page. And about three months ago, this changed. And this is just kind of shocking to me. Again, I guess over time they decided we can trust Jim. He's not going to do anything stupid. So it's like now it's, I submit something to the HuffPo and it just completely bypasses editorial. It just goes up. And that's nuts to me. I mean, just the whole notion of how Poe goes out to 30 to 32 million people worldwide. And it's like, shouldn't there be somebody to kind of look at that and go, oh, he says Walt Disney is alive and tap dancing in Toledo. That that, that can't be real. Can, can that? And, you know, and so it's like, 
well, he wrote it, put it up and it just, it just goes, it's, you know, so I don't know. I, I just, I both love this era that we work in for instant media, but at the same time, it occasionally scares the crap out of me. Cause it just, again, that whole notion of click and send, and it goes to, to all of these people. I mean, at least when it's, Jim Hill Media and I screw up, you know, it's just sort of like, okay, my small group of writers or my readers, I'm sorry, I won't do that again, you know, where it's HuffPo. I mean, that's why I always try to fact check out the wazoo because once it goes, it goes. You know, with great power comes great responsibility and I mean that you're living it. <laughs> but, you know, just that there's a line out of the rescuers. I always bring this up when people talk about this, you know, that there's a moment out of the rescuers that I love where it's Penny you know, at the boat, you've seen her in tears and now here come Bernard and Bianca and they're going to rescue her. And it's like, you know, and she looks at them and she's grateful that they're there, but she also says, didn't you bring anyone big with you? Like the police? You know, I just, that's the thing. I just keep thinking with, with HuffPo. It's like, isn't there somebody big here? Isn't there somebody who really should be in control? Like, no, go ahead. Put up your story. We trust you. <laughs> So once you decide you wanted to be a writer and you were about to embark on being an adult, leaving high school, what steps did you take? I think the thing of writing is there's a line that Lawrence Kasdan, the gentleman who wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Big Chill, and oddly enough, they brought him back to work on episode seven of Star Wars for Disney. He said this really interesting thing that, that stuck with me, that a career in writing is like having homework for the rest of your life. All right. So that's the thing of, you know, every so often I'll, I'll counsel writers, you know, that people will reach out to me with an idea or a book proposal or, or something like that. And the whole notion of, I wrote it, it's done. And it's like, really? You, you didn't reread it? You, I mean, every time I read something that I wrote, I mean, all that jumps out at me is like, oh, the errors. Oh, you moron. You know, it's like I could do so much better. And so you rewrite and you rewrite and rewrite. And even when you put things out into the world, you look at it like, oh, I forgot that. I should have put that in there. So it's always about you have to work at your craft. You have to I have to be willing to do the research. You have to put in the time. I mean, you know, the gentleman who wrote The Tipping Point talks about, you know, in order to get good at what you do, and I'm not saying I'm good at what I do. I just got, I got lucky. For some reason, people like the crap that I write. All right. You know, I, I have a way to tell a story that's reasonably amusing. But these gentlemen, the gentleman who did The Tipping Point talks about the 10,000 hour rule, that you have to do something in order to, to get proficient or good or you know he always makes the example of the Beatles had to play in those horrible clubs in Germany for 10,000 hours before they became the Beatles before they became really comfortable with one another and knew all one another's riffs and knew how to do the harmonies and you know that's how they became the Beatles Neil Simon who wrote all those wonderful plays you know the odd couple the chapter two prisoner of second avenue he spent hundreds of hours working, you know, writing sketches for Sid Caesar and, and Phil Silver. And, you know, there's, you have to practice your craft. You have to put in the time. And, you know, the nice thing about the web is, you know, when I was coming up, it, again, it was magazines and newspapers. And you had to hope and pray that when you submitted something that, you know, somebody opens a manila envelope, reads it, thinks you're funny, and will publish your story. And so there was this whole pyramid structure where you had to have the early person who was reading the slush pile, like what you did, who handed it to the editor above them, who then handed it to the editor in chief, who signed off on the idea, who said, okay, we will deem to publish this and send, you know, the idiot messages as a check. Nowadays, in the world of blogs, the pyramid structure is a pancake. Of course, the problem is getting people's attention because there's a billion blogs out there. But anybody can anybody can write now and anybody can catch people's attention. It's always amazing to me to watch who breaks through. But, you know, the, the weird thing that is, is that the people who do, in fact, break through typically have a unique view or, you know, bring some fun, interesting stuff to the table. You know, if I'm, I'm encouraging people to enter this field, it, it's actually it's a great time. You know, there's no editors barring the way. The only thing that's barring the way is you. You know, you have to be the one but again, the other, other thing you have to understand about writing for the web, 
Um, I think I mentioned this about the Wizard of Oz story. 15 years to write that story. And people are like, oh, I like that. That was really good. I, I really enjoyed that. What else you got? And, you know, the very next day, I talk about when I write for the web, you got to understand this is like you get up every day and throw a brick in the Grand Canyon. All right. The web's appetite for new content is bottomless. All right. Unending. So no matter how well you do, no matter what, how many podcasts you've recorded, how many stories you've written, it's like, that's good. What else you got? And you have to be able to to produce. You have to be self-disciplined enough to go, yes, I would love to sit and watch all eight of the Harry Potter movies as they are showing on ABC Family this weekend. But I got to sit down and crank on a story. So that's what you do. And, you know, you have to make sacrifices. Just this week coming up, I am so far in the weeds in regard to stories that I am overdue on and stuff I got to get done. Next week in San Diego is the white, San Diego is the white hot center of the pop culture universe. They do a Comic-Con for four and a half days. All of these amazing people come to one place and do these amazing presentations. And, uh, you know, I, I was credentialed. I'm all set to go. I got a, a wonderful room at a bed and breakfast. It's a mile away from the hall. And I had to stare down the barrel and go, I can go. I got to stay home and work. So luckily I have a beautiful, smart daughter who can go on my place and do a lot of interviews. And I have a nice understanding ex-wife who will also go and do some interviews. And even her husband now does some photography for the site. I mean, it's weird. We're a sitcom about to happen, folks. I understand that. But still, they help out. Sometimes you have to do that. You have to stare down the barrel of, it's like I'll be at a press event. Ooh, there's still shrimp and they're still serving alcohol. And ooh, there's cake. And it's like, no, I got to go back to the room and write got to walk out of the party and go work you can't play and it's weird because again you know just like every so often i find myself i mean this this weird space where it's like come down you know the universe has come down for the opening of Diagon Alley, you know and i mean it's, it was a great in, invite but it was just this whole notion of oh i gotta go to florida again and that means changing planes in Philadelphia and, you know, I got to pack and I got to do laundry and it's just sort of like, hey, you know, anybody else, I'm going to a theme park. Yay. And I, I'm like, Oh, it's, I'm going to the proctologist again and I better wear my good pants. You know, just again, you, you have to sometimes remind yourself, no, you have a gig that P other people would kill for, you know, it's like, come see our cartoon. Come let us send you a, box of swag, you know, come down to our theme park and ride a new, I mean, again, that was the thing we got the ride on Gringotts, you know, during a time when they couldn't really keep the ride running and it's a great ride. That's why I actually lived in Orlando for uh, four years in, in the nineties. That was actually when Michelle and I lived there, I want to say 93 to 97 before we split. And every so often people will say, well, why aren't you in California? Why, why are you doing this in New Hampshire? And I honestly think that there are a lot of folks who are actually in the Orlando area who are covering Disney now. And I also, I kind of feel sorry for them because sometimes I'll go to the park with them and they will pick the weirdest stuff to get a, oh, look, they didn't paint the bench the right color. You know, oh my God, the trash can is six inches too far away from the entrance. It's one of these things where it's like, you don't notice the $100 million attraction right in front of you. It's like, no, 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 the flowers are in the wrong place. It's weird. They live in the candy shop now. And because they live in the candy shop and they go to the candy shop every day, they've lost their taste for chocolate. I mean, for the rest of us, going to Disney World or going to Disneyland, that's a treat. All right. And you, get, you walk in and, ooh, you know, look at the right. And there's a parade and fireworks. And they're the ones, you know, it's like, well, you know, I got to go over and get pictures of the construction wall because, you know, they put up a different wall. You know, it just, it just, they get obsessed about the wrong end of it. And sometimes they forget. And that's the thing I always try to, whenever I find myself drifting in the direction of like, Oh God, I gotta get in a plane and go to do something. And it's like, you moron, shut up. There are hundreds of people that would say, get rid of him. I will take Jim Hill's place. I will do that. And I will be excited, you know? And so you just, you, you have to keep that in mind. You can't get jaded. And that's tough sometimes. Because they're, you know, now we're, we live in a world where it's not just Disney doing great things in theme parks. It's Universal. And SeaWorld's also doing some some pretty impressive stuff. And there's lots of little parks. And there's, and God, you know, in animation, there's what? There's Pixar. There's DreamWorks. There's Disney. There's Disney Toon Studios. There's Blue Sky. Warner's just did this amazing Lego movie. And they're going to get even crazier into animation. And 
you got to stay on top. And where that gets interesting is, of course, all the people who are working at these studios now are former Disney or Pixar or DreamWorks employees. So, you know, these are people I've interviewed in the past and they're like, hey, come talk about my movie. So it's like, all right. So I'll try. So what roadblocks have you hit along the way? I don't like being the type of guy who bitches about stuff, but uh, it was tough in 2001 when Al Lutz tossed me off of Mouse Planet. That was weird. I was actually talking with David Koenig, who still writes for Mouse Planet, and another writer who worked there. And we were uh, – Mouse Planet had sort of peaked at that point. They had really been riding the construction of Disney's California Adventure. And the park had just opened. And, yeah, we knew the park had problems, but it was just one of these things where it's like I was talking with David and it's like, again, coming out of the magazine newspaper world, it's like, I don't think this this website can can sustain momentum just writing about DCA. I thought that, you know, it would be a smart time at that point to sort of diversify, you know, just have everybody. And, again, I just I wanted to do what we did out of the print world. So everyone would have an individual beat. And so it was like, you know, David and I were talking about, well, what could we do? Well, I could cover animation and you could do theme parks. So we could have Al do gossip. And we were going to pitch this to Al. And Al, for some reason, found out, thought it was threatening. And inside of a five-hour period, threw me off of Mouse Planet, delisted everything that I'd ever written to the site. And, you know, and again, it was weird because I had been there part of growing this site and growing the audience, and so, but it was his site, and he tossed me out. And then from there, I struggled, God, uh, for a year and a half, two years, trying to find a new niche. I, I went and worked with the folks at Laughing Place, and Doobie and Rebecca Mosley are really, really sweet people, and they're good friends to this day, but it, it just didn't work. I wrote a little sharper than I think they were interested in. They loved the history and stuff that I did. They were always a little worried about possibly offending people. I think it's Mark Twain that said, you know, that if, you know, if you're not offending somebody, you're really not doing your job as a writer. Somebody's got to be offended. And then I worked Tony Ward on DCA Central, and that's a site that crashed and burned. So I was out in California visiting with my ex and my daughter and, DCA Central, you know, was falling apart while I was out there and getting on a plane to go home. And it's like, oh, God, I got to start again. I got to find a place to write on the web. And from the time it took me to fly home from Long Beach to New Hampshire, Michelle went out and bought the domain name Jim Hill Media and set it up and said, all right, it's yours. Run it. And for the longest time, I actually thought Jim Hill Media was a stupid name for a website. Again, I come from this fairly large family. There's seven of us, my parents and three brothers and a sister. And again, when you come from a family of that size, it's, you're not supposed to, you know, just, it's all about me. It's like, no moron. There's a lot of us here that, you know, just, so it just seemed to me that the name Jim Melita was incredibly egotistical, but Michelle was, you know, very persistent. In fact, her catchphrase for the website was like, finally a website that won't fire him. And as it turns out, it was actually a really smart move. One I personally never would have made, but it was like, weirdly branding because my name was on the site and I wrote stories for the site. So, Oh, you're Jim Hill me. And it took me a long time to be comfortable saying, hi, I'm Jim Hill of Jim Hill media. It's like, hi, I'm from the department of redundancy department. I mean, it just seemed like a really stupid name. Um, but over time, the internet finally became legit and it became easier to say, hi, I'm a blogger you know, as opposed to a writer. So that was tough. I mean, when you're part of something and getting thrown out of it arbitrarily, that's tough and not being able to fit. But yeah, I mean, I guess the lesson there was just, (sighs) you have to persist and you have to do what you do and hope that people like it. And I got lucky, you know, just about the same time I'm getting Jim Hill Media out of the ground. I go to a, a, a mega mouse meet in Florida and that's where I meet Len Testa and Bob Salinger, the editor and the publisher of The Unofficial Guide. And they're doing a group photo of us, all of us Disney dweebs in one place. And so I'm at the back of the thing with Len and Bob. And I'm basically doing what I've done my entire life, which you whisper things under your voice and you make people laugh around you. Bob and Len had never met a funny Disney person up to that point. You know, I mean, they've been very sweet and very serious about Disney. And 
here was this fat man at the back of the pile joking about Disney. And it's like, ooh, we like you. And that's how I ended up first writing the Disney dish items for the unofficial guide. I think I've done them for like 10 years now. And then the weird offshoot about two and a half, uh, three years ago, Len decided, you know, this might be fun to do. I have fun talking to you. I think other people would would have fun listening to us talk. And that became the unofficial guide Disney dish podcast. And that took off in a really weird way. You know, it's just, it's just a lot of them are just Len and I walking around the park and he turns in the mic and says, okay, fat man talk. And it's just sort of like, you know, whatever attraction we're in front of, I have stories about because I've been talking to an Imagineers for 30 years. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, it's weird. Maybe if I'd stayed at Mouse Planet, that gig, that door wouldn't have opened. So I, I guess you have to leave yourself open for sometimes things that you want don't happen, but for the right reason. Yeah, I would agree. Would you say that downtime after Mouse Planet, you just keep writing regardless? You had to. That's It just comes down to the only way in a situation like that where you know you suddenly lose your forum, you lose the place where people know you at. It's just like, and in fact, that was what was kind of funny was that people looked for me. They liked what I wrote and well, where the hell did he go now? You know, and just in fact, when I went from Mouse Planet to the Laughing Place to DC8 Central and to watch how the people who would comment on the stories would, hey, I found you again. And it's sort of like, it's like, thank you, Google. But yeah, I just, I just have to persevere. In a situation like that where you get knocked down, it's just sort of like the classic, definition of success you get you know knocked down two times and you get up three it's something like that you just okay all right didn't work out back to work so you could you share a favorite memory i've been very lucky i've gotten to do some really 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 cool things you know and and they keep happening i mean just this within the past month nancy and i were at the new amsterdam theater and michael carzerin the the gentleman who uh, orchestrates all of the music for, you know, if, if it's a Disney stage show or a Disney animated musical, Michael's had a hand in it. All right. And I was interviewing him and he's like, Oh, well, hang on, let's go downstairs. And he actually took us into the basement of the new Amsterdam. We were down in the orchestra pit. What was really cool was that, you know, I, that's neither Nancy and I had ever been in this place or a big professional New York Broadway theater. It was one of these things where I turned to Nancy and said, well, you got to do it. So she actually climbed up to where the conductor stood and got to look out into the world and see the view that a conductor gets at a Broadway show. And it's like, and she said, oh, you got to do this. Like, no, 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 that's yours. I think half the fun of this job is getting to share and doing something like that. Nancy, who studied music a lot of her life to, to be in that sort of position was cool and special for her. Conversely, I was just down at Disney. I, again, I was, was down earlier this year for the opening of Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. And again, Nancy, because she wants me to be a less fat man, has me going to water aerobics three times a week. And I, again, when you're the guy in water aerobics, you're at the back of the class. You're the one drowning in the deep end because you don't want to frighten the women. And it turns out there was this high school kid who was next to me. And his mother had brought him along. His name was Joe. He played in the, the Nashua marching band. And he mentioned that he was going to be down at Disney. It turns out the date he mentioned that his high school was going down and marching through the Magic Kingdom was the day that they were going to have the party for the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, the press party. And I was like, wow, well, if you're down there, let me see if I can get you on the attraction. And as it turns out, we go into the party and it's like Fort Knox. The security is ridiculous. And meanwhile, Joe is giving me a call. He's in the park. He's with his family. And it's like, geez, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this happen. And I, just, I feel bad because I promised this kid that I would try to get him into this ride. And meanwhile, we've gotten, we've gotten on it because of the press thing four or five, six times at this point. It's a great ride. We're really enjoying it. But I still feel bad that I promised Joe that I would try to get him on this. And that doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so meanwhile, we the word sweeps through the party that Grumpy Cat is there. And Nancy, who loves cats, just like suddenly, the grumpy cat is here. And so, you know, I, we're there with Shelly Karen, the woman behind her. Excellent website, by the way. We're, quick plug on the go and MCO. But Nancy just basically, you go to the back. And Shelly, you go to the front. We're going to find this cat. 
And so everybody takes off in different directions. So I'm walking to the back of the party and they've blocked off basically the perimeter of Seven Dwarf Mine Trains with these sort of mobile hedge things that Disney has. But as I get to the back, I notice that, that you know, the old mercantile shop from Mickey's Toontown Fair that, that's now, I guess it's called Big Top Mercantile now because it's in the Dumbo Circus area. But there's this hole in the hedge and there's a plaid, one of the people from Guest Relations standing in the hole. And I walk up to her and it's like, that's where the restrooms are, isn't it? She's, yes, sir. Says, can I go back there? Absolutely. And they're like, ah, I found the hole in the perimeter. You know, so I got back, I used the restroom and I called Joe and I said, get your ass back here to Big Top Mercantile. And so five minutes later, he and his mom and his dad and the cousins show up. And I go, I'm sorry, I can only get one person in, or I think I can get one person in. And I now turn to the plaid and I just explain the situation that Joe has come all the way from New Hampshire and he marched in your park today and he entertained all these people. And, you know, can't, can't we make an exception? Well, can't we get this kid in here? I'm just, you know, just, and the plaid, I, what I love about her is she stepped out of the doorway and she deliberately sort of turns her back to me and it's like, you know, I never noticed that architectural detail over there before. And I grab Joe, we run through the entrance or the exit and I get him on the ride. And seriously, the second the ride is over, we pull back into the station. There's an announcement. The party is over. So we, we got him in at the last possible moment, but he's hooting. He's screaming. He's having a great time. More to the point, he has bragging rights over the other 250 members of his high school band. Cause he got on the ride and they didn't. And that to me, is in the last six or eight months, that's a, that's one of my top Disney related memories. Cause it's like, again, I was able to do something nice I, and to somebody who, you know, who lives outside the chocolate shop, who loves chocolate, you know, and, and got this t- extra special taste of it ahead of everybody else. You know, I mean, I'd been on it a couple of times that night and I was beginning to think it's a good ride. But riding with Joe, it's like, oh, it's a great ride. They really did a nice job. And as a civilian, he confirmed that. I guess that comes from being in a large family, you know, just the whole notion of you're taught to share your toys. And so, you know, for example, when the Big Hero 6 box showed up today, it was just sort of like, okay, so, you know, my daughter is coming out to spend three weeks with us this summer, and she called today to check in and said, okay, the Big Hero 6 box showed up, so, you know, Nancy's getting the t-shirt, I get the action figure, you get the hat. And it's like, cool, I'm done. You know, so again, share your toys. I guess that's the lesson. With all the great memories that you've shared so far today, has there been any real disappointments with your dream along the way? I mean, I'm, I know being kicked off of a mouse planet was, but outside of that. No, I, you know, the, the weird thing is I think I've never been one of these guys who nurses. I, I can hold a grudge the same way I can hold my breath. You know, it, it's just one of those things you can get mad, you can get angry, you can get disappointed. But it's like if you dwell on it, it's like how much time, how much energy are you willing to put into preserving a bad memory? You know, just to to keep it close, to keep it tight. They always talk about how what's kind about memory is over time, the corners get shaved off, the sharp edges fade away. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, have there been disappointments? Have there been hurts? I'm the first divorce in my family. I'm not particularly proud of that. But I worked hard at becoming my ex-wife's friend. I worked hard at becoming a good long distance daddy. And, and, and that's, I, I think that one of the things I'm proudest of now is that I have this great relationship with my daughter who's out in California with my ex and I'm in the spot I wanted to be in. You sometimes see kids of divorce who with their dads get overly excited and, you know, there's a lot of pressure to deliver to build strong memories because they don't see one another enough. In my case with my daughter, it's the exact opposite. I am the taken for granted dad. I wanted so badly to be the sort of the parental equivalent of like every other parent on the planet. I wanted to be the dad. You know, we talk every night on Skype and, you know, cell phone or whatever. And it's just sort of like dad. Yeah, dad. All right. And no big deal that, oh, dad is coming to town. That is actually one of the sweeter parts of this gig that I do get to go to California as often as I do and get to hang with Alice or get to take her to <sighs> when she grows up, she wants to be a sequential artist. In fact, she's at uh, Long Beach 
community college right now building your portfolio to eventually go after a degree at Cal Arts. though <laughs> the interesting thing is she just went and covered a panel for our website at the LA Film Festival and here's Alex Hirsch the gentleman who produced Gravity Falls for Disney Channel which is this great series if you haven't seen it you really got to do but he was up there talking about how he went to Cal Arts and he said what was great about Cal Arts is they made us make them one movie a year but it's also crazy expensive and wouldn't it make more sense in the long run if you were a filmmaker just to make your movies put them up on on YouTube or iTunes or whatever get the world's attention and break through there where as opposed to putting yourself and your family in debt you know to go to to Cal Arts and it was just kind of both I didn't know whether to punch him or shake his hands when I heard that news because it's like I don't know if that's the lesson I want my daughter hearing but at the same time I kind of like that my daughter heard that so I, I just I don't believe it, it's healthy to obsess on disappointment. I mean it, it's good to learn the lessons if you did something stupid you know, to remember that, but at the same time, not to obsess on failure or obsess on mistakes or things that might have been. It's just sort of, I think it's more positive to to just march forward, to just learn from your mistakes and apply them to future projects and be done with it. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that about film. I was just talking to my cousin who went to school for film mm -hmm. direction, and I was like, you know, in this day and age, if you can't make something entertaining for about a hundred bucks or less... Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, it's probably not a good idea for you to seek out professional major debt education on that. Oh, no, I totally agree. And it just, and, and, but you feel bad because that's what we've been taught. You know, you want that piece of sheepskin hanging on the wall to validate things where, you know, the, the weird thing is, at least when you work in film and animation, your degree and your student film will get you your first job, but only your first job. It's everything you do after that point that makes your career. And, and yes, you know, for the longest time, for the last 10 or 15 years, there were a lot of people that's like, Ooh, you know, everyone at Pixar went to Cal Arts, So I want to go there. But I, I just, I worry that there's a generation of kids who think that's a straight pipe into Pixar. And it really isn't, you know, what's a straight pipe into Pixar or Disney or DreamWorks or Blue Sky is a really good student film and a demonstration of a really good worth ethic. And beyond that, it's all a crapshoot. What would you say your dreams for the future look like? You know, I'm really happy with where I am right now. I mean, I just, I live with a, a lovely young woman. Well, she's my age. What am I talking about? I'm 55. I'm sorry. We grade on a curve here, folks. I plan on living to be 110. And we have two annoying cats. I get to do fun stuff. I get to drive down to New York or go out to LA or Orlando. I'm working on a book. You know, I get to see my daughter, you know, regularly. My parents are in relatively good health. My dreams for the future is I'd like this to continue. I'd like to meet more people who have fun sh stories to share. I'd like to help promote their films or their projects or whatever. I'd like to keep holding open doors for people who are getting their careers started or offering advice. I guess that the funnest part about my job is that I get to, I get to wake up at, you know, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning and I can be professionally ignorant. You know, this is my job. Someone will ask me something. Hey, have you heard about this? It's like, no, I haven't. But I can get on the phone or I can get on the Internet and I can research it and I can pull together info and I can build a story. And by the end of the day, I've actually learned something and hopefully I'm sharing something with my audience. And then I get to do it again tomorrow. I mean, just I think, you know, I can. That's the nice thing. I always, something new is always coming through the door for me. And I know there's a lot of people you know, again, I come from a family of teachers and, and there's a certain repetitive nature to that. Because again, you're teaching, you know, the, the teaching first graders who become second graders, who become third graders. And I have great respect for those folks who can keep it fresh and can keep something that they've done over and over and over again and, and, and make it new and unique and wonderful for people coming through the door. But I have the luxury of just real new comes through the door every day. Just again, like the big Hero 6 box. So is there any last thoughts you'd like to share? Um, I, again, it's, it's, it's kind of flattering to, again, when the, the invitation came to the door to come do this show. Um, but I, I, the very thing that the very nature of, you know, the title of the show, it, it dreams. I mean, I know how people have a lot of, dreams that you know that they want to come true that they want for their lives in my own case everything i ever achieved happened for 
two reasons. All right. Uh, either somebody was very, very kind to me and I'm not just talking about Disney legends. I'm talking about Nancy, the, the woman in my life. When, when we met was right after I was divorced from Michelle, I was a miserable wreck. My kid was 6,000 miles away in Hawaii. I, you know, I, I was, I was a reclamation project. You know, I would, you know, I, she looked at a swamp and thought, yeah, I could do something with that. So, you know, that that's, I, again, every good thing that's happened in my life for the past 15, 20 years flows from Nancy. Uh, also flows from my parents who, again, when I was at my lowest and my worst gave me, you know, again, it's the, uh, what is it? The, the Tom, Thomas Wolf line is, you know, the effect of, you know, home is where they have to take you in. You know, when I was divorced and my life was crashing down around my head, they threw open the door again and allowed me to come home. So I try to remember that. I try to remember that when I needed people to be kind and generous, they were. And, I, you know, it's it's just sometimes in today's world when we are so cynical or we're on deadline or, you know, that sort of thing, it's easy, so easy to say no. Uh, and what I would just suggest is if, if, you know, just trying to remember you where you are in your life, where you are in your careers, because somebody saw the sweaty person on the other side of the desk with the bad resume and took the chance. OK, so just try to remember that. I just it, it just seems in this Internet age where it's Facebooking or, or Twittering and trying to figure out you know, 140 characters, how we can be mean to one another, just. Be nicer, okay? So that's it. There, there's, there's me. This is as profound as I get, folks. All right? <laughs> I think that's a great message, Jim. You want to uh, plug all your websites? Oh, God. Uh, okay. What have I got going on here? Uh, okay, we got Jim Hill Media. We got the Huffington Post, where I'm supposed to be writing two stories a week. At least uh, I do my podcast with... Uh, you know, uh, uh, Len, the unofficial guy, Disney Dish, and we're actually we're doing our first ever live show, uh, actually in um, at Flushing Meadows in a couple of weeks, uh, August sixteenth. We're we're going out there. It's uh, myself, Len Testa, and Mike Newell is joining us for the show, and we're we're doing sort of a tribute to the fiftieth anniversary of uh, the New York World's Fair, but we're actually recording it with an audience. And then putting that up as a podcast. And we're kind of hoping that if that works, we can then use this as an excuse to go to all these places that I've always wanted to do shows from, like go to Virginia and do one about Disney's America or go to Long Beach and talk about Port Disney. And, you know, so it would be really great if this were a success. So if you people want to come, that'd be cool. And of course, I'm I'm here with Joe on his show. And thank you for inviting me. This was Really nice of you to let me talk for way too long. You are going to edit this, right? Like with a hacksaw and a chisel and get it down to three or four hours. Is that the plan now? You know? <laughs> well, there there is some editing, but uh, it'll probably oh, still be about an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, I, I apologize to all you people. Okay. You know, just you got things to do, right? Laundry, cooking, you know, just make the bed. I owe you all an hour and a half of your lives. I'm really sorry. No, it, it, the pleasure was all mine. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and even over the time to come on. The stories are great and the messages were, were wonderful. I, I think that a lot of people are going to resonate with it. And uh, I hope a lot of people check out your, your website and your work. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to be there on August 16th. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, but unfortunately, I'll be on the West Coast. <laughs> oh, well, enjoy the West Coast. Where are you going? Uh, well, we're going to Vegas and then to California uh, for L.A. and Disney. My first time in Disneyland as well as my wife's oh, first time in Disneyland. very cool. Wow. Well, enjoy. I mean, just I, I'll be intrigued to hear your thoughts. I've always felt that Disney World is a little too big where Disneyland it's just, it's the right scale. It's just, there's something about that's it's, it's so charming that coupled with Vegas. Have you done Vegas before? No, it's my first time there too. Ooh, scary town. Okay. <laughs> Again, we'll, we'll love to hear stories from your experience there. I'm, I'm, you know, I was just out there for the licensing show and man, that, that town, it just, it just, I feel like they, they just like, if we could just pick up your ankles and shake you for a while to your money fell, fell out, we'd leave you alone. You know, just, <laughs> just, 
amazing time but, but anyway thank you again this was a treat to do the show and i again please edit it i mean i swear to god get a hacksaw out to try to get it down to, to at least five hours all right you know, just <laughs> okay so. i will try my best i promise all right thank you again joe thank you all right take care thank you for joining us for this episode of the dreamers podcast follow us on twitter at dreamers podcast join us on facebook at facebook.com slash dreamers podcast if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the dreamers podcast please send an email to j at jpar.co this podcast is copyright 2014 by jpar.co